inform with our ideas the legislation that will then be compiled or be formulated for us to be able to operate and move forward. As the legislature, we are not tasked with service delivery per se, but we are tasked with making sure that through one of our mandates, as prescribed by the Constitution, that we, op we, we engage in public participation and, and education. That is the platform where we open for dialogue. That is the platform where we open for engagement for the people to be able to talk to so that our society must know that there is a people where we can, there is a, a platform where we can be heard. There is a platform where we can be able to speak and, 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 and have our ideas be able to be taken up for those who are supposed to be the implementers of, of a, our goals as the nation. Through this measure, set by the United Nations, we are able to continuously liaise with different sectors and non-governmental organizations dealing with women. The process enables us to initiate and finalize legislation and policies to be implemented by various government departments and entities and or state organs. Our policies do not grow from trees. They are part of a prolonged process of stakeholder engagement. At the legislature, we are part of the national efforts towards gender streamlining, gender policy and project implementation, gender training and ensuring gender in integration even in the context of Labor Relations Act. We have had a number of meetings not only as the province, but the parliament with the gender commission on, for gender equality. The aim of these meetings is to monitor and evaluate the extent to which the Beijing Declaration of 1995 and other relevant recommendations are implemented. We need to take stock to be able to say since Beijing 1995, how far have we gone as the country in ensuring that we implement the objectives that are in the declaration. The theme, women equality, realizing women's socio-economic emancipation and empowerment for just and equal society is the theme that we chose for this year, which seek to draw lessons from international practices and it is directed at advancing and pressing on the struggle towards total achievement of equal rights for women, definite progress and decisive opportunities for all women. Women in rural areas in our country and in, in particular our province remain the target of our socio-economic intervention. We need to make sure that we do not leave women in rural areas. We do not leave women in those areas that sometimes they sit there and we forget about them. So what, whatever target we come up with, whatever intervention we come up with, it is the intervention that must seek to touch those women. It must target those women so that we can be able to liberate them uh, 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 as, as we, we advance the socio-economic struggle. Our role, therefore, is to ensure that development of legislation by the provincial legislature are directly aimed at emancipating all our women from the shackles of poverty and uh, underdevelopment. If we do so, our actions will connect directly with the ideals of our great leaders, such as Lillian Goy, who was a trade unionist herself, Helen Joseph, Albertina Sisulu, and, and Sophia Williams de Brain, and many other women that have started this struggle, fighting for the recognition of women as human beings. In conclusion, program director, at the center of all the work we do, we are seeking means and ways 
of ensuring that women are in control of their own lives. We seek to ensure that women do not have to wait for validation from their male counterparts. Equally, women must not expect that they, they are willful struggles relating, uh, uh, must be validated rather by men or by society, especially on how to resolve problems relating to gender-based violence. At home, in the workplace, in the economy and politics, in the society at large, if we can free ourselves, if we can embark on socio-economic freedom, I believe women could be able, in a way, to stand up for themselves against the gender-based violence. Many women die because when they think of getting out of that relationship, of getting out of that marriage, is the issue of how am I going to take care of these children? Women need to find a way to be able to be fulfilled and by doing, by, the only thing that can assist them is the empowerment so, through social economic uh, 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 process. We are happy that women representation in parliament, in provincial departments and in municipalities has increased beyond 27% to above 50%. We are currently working towards ensuring that the national average of women representation exceeds 50%. It should exceed 50% because women form the largest uh, uh, population in terms of numbers in the society. So why should we remain just under or at parity? We need to push for, 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 for more than 50% representation. In fact, in my view, a society would be a better place if we can have many women getting up and standing up and be able to use ourselves as, advoca as advocates for change in, 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 in our society. Having said that, I wish to say to all women who are here, enjoy this session. Let us engage progressively. Let us engage fruitfully. And, and everything that we are going to say is valued. Every idea means something. Together, we can change the plight of women in the society. Whatever we do, at the back of our mind, we have that woman who doesn't know what they are going to feed their children tonight when, before they go, they go to bed. That woman who doesn't know how to get out of this dungeon that he fi she finds herself in because she doesn't have means and ways to be able to do so. So whatever we do, whatever we say, the most, Im most importantly, we must be able to say, how do we force our government to implement the legislative pieces that are there that seek to liberate women socially and economically, for them to be independent and human beings, not stay where they are not, not supposed to be because they are forced by the circumstances that prevail in their lives. I thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. I personally have drawn a number of things in, in what the Speaker has addressed us on. And uh, I'm sure you also have drawn a number of things and that also will pave a way as to where should we actually push for the implementation of the legislations that we are having in place. The Women Charter, as adopted in 1954, 
Its objective was to call for a society where women are free from discrimination and prejudice. It, it speaks more of women's rights. A society that respects women and enforces their rights and their women dignity. You look in, in terms of a, 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 a economy, and I'm saying this because there's a, there's a representative from the office of, the highest office in the province, that we, we, we would perhaps get some of the answers that we're asking ourselves as to how far are we in terms of emancipating women in economy, the rights and opportunities that are available uh, in, 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 in the skills. Because re research shows that women's skills in the labor force add much value to a national economy. Where are they? It seems as if women are good enough to be deputies. If it's a director a, a post, a woman has to be a deputy director. If it is a, a DG post, a woman has to be a DDG. I sometimes feel that they are being created just to shut us up and say, you are there, you are there. What else do you want? What more do you want? You also go, it is not only happening in the free state, it happens across the, 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 the country, even in politics. If it's a secretary a, a position, a woman has to be a deputy secretary. If it's a chairperson a position, a woman has to be a deputy chairperson. Are we degraded to that, that you shall just be here? Or are we being valued uh, 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 for what we are worth? Uh, uh, we, we, we need to talk about, when we engage, Perhaps it will be very necessary to speak our experiences. We have been getting speeches, we have been writing papers, but what will speak the most, we will, it will be the experiences. We have young people who are not working. And if you look at the numbers as per the, 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 the population of the country, a lot of those young people are women. And I'm sure even those who are present today, they will attest to that fact that there are more women who are unemployed than men. And what do you get from our young, intelligent women? They, they, they're facing difficulties at home and everywhere they are. And what do we see? We see patriarchy at play, where women are then the, the objects of men with monies, the objects of men with positions. Therefore, this is the time that we need to assert ourselves better than we had before and, 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 and show the world that this time and this moment and this era, it calls for nothing else but the skills that women possesses. With, with those words, I would like to call upon the representative from the office of the speaker, Mekerol Mugube. A round of applause for Mekerol. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Program Director from Office of the Premier, not the Speaker. Thank oh, you. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, the Honorable Speaker, Deputy Speaker, and Delegates, and all the House at large. It really gives me pleasure, and thank you, uh, Speaker, for giving me the opportunity to present today join the Women's Parliament. I'm sure our country is facing the three inequalities, the three triple challenges, which are the inequality, uh, poverty, and uh, unemployment. I'm sure the free state is not separate from that. It's also affected by those challenges facing the country. Uh, talking about economic 
emancipation. I was requested to focus mainly on the statistics of women employment in senior management within the province in government. We know that the economic development of women in the country and the province will lead to the reduction of poverty. More women should be hired in senior management positions and vacancies be created, which means that shows that uh, more men are employed in government and also in senior positions than women. So with me here, I've got, uh, I was able to get the latest statistics of females in all the government departments. But uh, with, I'm sure with permission, the uh, uh, program director trying to cut short at the time. I will say, um, we know that government has a level, four levels, which is level 13 is the entry to senior management and the last level is level 16. And if you look through the government departments, I will say all the departments, most of the departments will find that women are more in the level 13. I employed at the entry level, which is level 13. And when we go to level 14, you'll find that very few women are there, whether it's one or two. Level 15, you'll find that it's also two or one woman, as compared to three or four males. And level 16, you'll also find that it's only one woman. I can say out of all the senior management in the province, we did at the moment we talk around 334. Only 142 is females in senior management. And when we talk about the 50-50, which is the legislation, I'm sure the speaker has talked a lot about that. Uh, it's only department of the premier that has 50-50, which is 50 women, females in senior management and 50 males uh, in senior management. Also social development is like that. It's also having more uh, females on senior management, which is 62, was, yes. Other departments, it's just like, less. I can see one of the departments has a half, is also was having 8% of women in senior management. And when it comes to HODs, out of all the HODs in the province, in all our departments, we only have one female HOD in the first state, which is based at social development. The rest are males. I'm sure uh, Department of uh, Public Service and Administration has declared the last week of August as senior management, women's senior management week for departments to look at the to look at the progress that the departments are doing in employing women and all that. But as the speaker has said that we've got legislations which are very good, but we've got poor implementation. I'm sure that's the situation I can present regarding issues of the statistics in the province. So women are not there yet at 50% in the province majority. Which means patriarchy is still playing a very important role even in the appointment of senior management. And we know that some of the women, uh, women leave their position because of other challenges. You'll find that they've got challenges at home because we've got responsibilities 
as wives, as mothers, as grandmothers. So you'll find that to cope with being a senior manager, where there is pressure, where there is no cooperation, and also at home we are faced with challenges of dealing with family responsibilities. Some of them end up uh, vacating the, the positions. And also, because we know that at work, when we've got a, a boss who's not cooperative, who's frustrating and make you miserable at work, and also we always say that some of the women senior management, we've got a pull-down syndrome. If we can hold up our and support each other, I'm sure our women can stay in their positions. But you'll find that when you've got a supervisor who is a male who's making you miserable, who's making all that, you also end up uh, resigning from your post of a senior manager. So women are having challenges. And we know that we've got a sexual harassment policy in the public sector so that whenever we've got issues of sexual harassment at work, women must talk, but we'll find that women end up keeping quiet. A person saying that I'd rather stay in the position rather than talking. Those are issues that we are facing. When I also move to Women in business, we all know that women are now entering the male-dominated industries such as mining, farming, transport industry, and the taxi industry. With more women entering these sectors, women are to become more economically empowered. We say the economic development of women can be used as a tool to reduce gender-based violence and femicide. We can work together with uh, non-governmental organizations, faith-based organizations, civil society to fight all this gender-based uh, violence. We know that when we say economic empowerment of to be used as tool for women to reduce gender-based violence. Women, as the speaker has mentioned, that we stay in abusive relationships because of unemployment and being dependent on men because we are unemployed and we lack skills. Secondly, because also GPV affects, we know that it's also directed at our children and the LGBT QI. All this, we know that patriarchy, men feel powerful over women. That's why they end up practicing gender-based violence over them. And it's important for us as women also to encourage our young girls to be educated, to be so that they can be economically independent, not to stay in abusive relationship and depend on their boyfriends or bless us for a living. So let us educate our girls and encourage them to be educated and be financially independent. And even women, they can be educated if they form consortiums, they work together, we, we give, empower them with skills and work, cooperate, they can be able rather than face the situation as individuals, they will work to up for any other whether economically developing situation as a group and apply to it. I'm sure when we are an individual, it becomes some difficult somewhere. But when we work as a group, as a collective, it makes a difference. I like to say our government is working very hard to fight uh, gender-based violence and femicide. We know that uh, 
the gender-based violence and femicide strategic plan was developed and presented to the president, uh, which covers from 2020 to 2030, for us to be able to address all issues facing GPV. And secondly, we know that the Victim Support Services Bill, it has been gazetted and is circulating for comments and for inputs from us as women. And the closing date is on the 16th of September, 2020. So it will be important for us as women because as victims now, the Victim Support Services Bill is trying to put on top that also victims have rights, as much as we are always looking at the rights of the perpetrator. But let's look at the rights of the victims. So please, people, let us respond and comment on that and submit our input, inputs to government. Uh, we know that also women play a very important sector uh, in the health sector. Women are also leading there as in the health situation. We know in HIV, women have been carers, they've played a very important role caring for us, for our children, for our families. Women are more infected by HIV than men, and women are also on more on antiretroviral therapy treatment than men. It's all from the anti, we know we've got the HIV antenatal survey that is conducted every two years. So women have a lot of challenges that we need to deal with. Even now when we are faced with the COVID-19, as the deputy speaker has mentioned, women are also in the leading uh, stage uh, fighting for that. We know that as mothers, as health workers, they are there leading the way. And as mothers, they're always teaching their children and making sure that put your mask when you go out, social distance, wash your hands. So all these are challenges that are faced by women. And, but when we pull each other and hold each other by hand and move forward, we can fight all this and make a difference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Meg Carroll. We appreciate the statistics. I must say they look terrible. What do you think? They are horrible to say the least. And this is a call for us gathered here to make sure and be intentional in, 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 in demanding programs that will show us and push a little bit harder to make sure that these horrible stories are changing. And I was hoping, Mekarol, that no one in this meeting will come out here speaking of a pulling her down syndrome. We know that story. We know that story. And I, I say we, we sit at here this, this morning and in this era of COVID-19 and thinking is the most horrible pandemic. If you want to know what is the most horrible pandemic, just take a look. Just, just take a corner and, and take, take a look at Patriarch. I call it amoeba, it changes. Sometimes it, it, it reflects itself as women fighting each other. But when you look very close, you would see there's, me, there's a man behind. This woman sitting in the meetings where she's only one, and the majority of the decision makers are men. And when they come out there, we lash in them and saying, you sit there, there's nothing that you can do for us. But we have forgotten that their voice is just a minute one. But the highest voice 
is the, the voices of men whom we are not going to leave behind. We want to take them along to make sure that they fight with us the very stubborn pandemic of patriarchy. And um, there are so many things that we can talk about, especially when it comes to unemployment of young women. And when they are employed, then there's a, a dead trap for them. They went to study with loans. And now they are seated with those loans and they have to pay. Those that are coming from uh, 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 better families, they are able to be covered by parents to pay the loans. But talk about these ones who are coming from families that do not have. They will sit with that. One day when they want to buy their own houses, that trap will, come, will be coming back. One day when they even want to to, 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 to get a flat just to, to, to hire a flat for them to stay in there, that that trap will always call them. Because the policies of uh, having a, opening a debt, they are not very friendly to women. They'll always look at them that, oh, you are a woman, single, uh, African, you will not be able to pay uh, the, the, the loan or pay uh, your, 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 your tenant. Uh, what you owe them. Therefore, I am trying to check if uh, our representative from the law sector is here. Oh, Stephanie, I see. While Stephanie is coming to address us, uh, I want us to have courage again. Even if we have seen uh, how things are not moving as, as fast as we want, I want us to also have courage and look back at what has happened, that there's some things that Parliament has done. It has passed some of the, 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 the legislations that were actually pushed by the Women's Charter itself. You look at the Domestic Violence Act 116 of 1998. It was because of the very Women's Charter that is there. You look at Criminal Act, uh, that one of uh, survival of offenses. It, it, it was because of the very charter, Act 32 of 2007, promotion of equality and, 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 and prevention of, 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 of the unfair discrimination of women. It was also because of women charter. Employment Equity Act uh, 55, also it was. Therefore, don't don't despise you sitting here and trying to push the issues. One day we'll be sitting here and say, these are the things that we push for. And today our children are eating from those fruits. The prevention and combating of trafficking in persons, it is also one of the acts that are there and passed because women stood up and say, we want that. Protection from harassment from work, I had misspoke about it. There is an act. All that we need to do is to make sure that uh, our, 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 our lawyers are making sure that they implement and, and we giving, uh, they give us joy. Not women going to court and they're being asked to show us how were you raped. Women are asked ridiculous questions that did you enjoy. You know, so th those are the, 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 the difficulties that we are facing. So it is a, it's, it is a good thing we're having uh, the representative of law that are women who will understand where we're coming from as women. Uh, therefore, I will call upon our sister here, uh, Stephanie, to speak to us on law. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Good morning, um, Madam Deputy Speaker, Speaker, Program Director, and guests today. I, I wish that I was here today to paint a better picture than what we have been hearing, but unfortunately in our sector, um, I must say, despite being the entity that is, is supposed to implement law, we are still the most untransformed sector in the country currently. Um, our, our problems are many. Um, they stem as, as far deep as colonialism and the apartheid system we come from. 
because the first Women's Legal Practice Act was only promulgated in 1923, and that is what gave women the opportunity to even study law. Um, so if we are talking about the first steps of women emancipation were then done by the men, and perhaps that is why we sit with the problems we sit with, because our democracy is still young and our country is very young in its freedom. And to be honest with you, um, women are not liberated as yet. Um, and without intentional and robust debates such as these, we will stay in the position. From the side of graduates that study law, um, they come in at about 67%, but the statistics show us that they don't stay in the sector. The attorneys come in at 43%, but they are not in senior positions, and this is women. Advocates currently in South Africa, only 18% of them are black women. And I'm bringing it home to the Free State. In the Free State bar today, there are only about three black women that are advocates that I can brief as an attorney. One of them is a colored lady, and it's one of my friends. And she's the only colored lady that is practicing as an advocate. There are no Indian women. So we're not only talking about just the black women, but even the demographic spread of Indians and coloreds. The black advocates are mainly expected to do things like family law and road accident fund, whereas the commercial and proper work that actually pays you good money as an advocate is given to the white males and the black males. There's also a move that sees that we are prioritizing racial equality over gender equality, and that is something very serious that's happening in the free state currently. Magistrates, um, while I was preparing for this, for this seminar today, as of 2017, only 21% were black, 5% were colored, and 6% were Indian women in magistrates. This is across South Africa. The judges, as much as we are a non-white population of 90%, as at 1994, only 23% of judges in the whole South Africa were women. In 2017, we have 70% black male judges, 46% black female, 11% colored female, 19% Indian, that are judges in South Africa. Taking it to the highest court of this country, the Constitutional Court, we sit with two black women, no colored women, and no Indian women, our constitutional judges currently today. When we speak about these issues, we are marked as problematic and we are then ostracized until we eventually leave the space. And this is not true liberation. I bring it back to the free state, and I look at a panel that we sit on here as attorneys. On this panel, I'm the only women-owned firm, and I haven't received work for the last 18 months. I've been waiting for payment for the last seven months. And that is the, that is the, the issues when we do business with government here in the free state. You go and you, 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 you beg them for your payment, they don't pay. Currently, a black female advocate, I gave her a first case, we actually won that case. She's also waiting for eight months, for 15,000 rand. I can't even reply to her emails anymore. And this is the, this is the, the dismal failure that government has done to, to empower us from, from a procurement spend, which is something I'll get to later. When we're looking at deployments of senior positions, like CEOs, and this is from my board perspective, because I sit on about four boards, and I must say it's like the program director mentioned, the women have become the deputy chairpersons, they become the deputy CEOs, they become the, the COOs, they don't become the CEOs. Those positions and the board chairperson positions, HODs, DGs, are mainly considered for black males. Again, there's a preference over racial equality versus gender equality, and that is what we are seeing currently in the space, even in the legal space. And even if we say it's a good move to, to employ and deploy women in this space, you're now seeing a, a surge of women coming in and they are persecuting and discriminating against younger women. That is what's happening. The first opposition you receive usually is from a woman, like the program director mentioned. Even, in, in, even with women in government, they prefer to work with black men, which is a phenomenon that till today I can't understand. The Free State Treasury Bulletin was released a few weeks back and this is the COVID PPE problems that have been plaguing the country and the, the African National Congress. On our bulletin, 10% of them, not even 10% are women. 90% of that bulletin is for men. And, and they are the ones now driving around in new cars during a pandemic that is ravaging the country. And, and you, you look at it and, you, and, you, and you, we, we praise the fact that women are now in these positions, but still they are preferring to work with the men. I don't know if that is the freedom we were dreaming of. 
Procurement of tenders in excess of a million rand, and this is even in the legal space, are given to the male-owned firms or the white male-owned firms. As a women-owned law firm, and I'm one of about three or four in the free state, we are not benefiting from any legal panel in this, free, in this city. Procurement is not shared with women or the youth. Women are oppressed and abused because they are not strong economically, and that is why they are dependent on the men. During the lockdown, the president implemented an alcohol ban. Statistics have shown us that 54% of tavern owners are women. And when the alcohol ban hit us for the last six months, those 54% of women who are single breadwinners were the most impacted. And this comes from the Free State Liquor Act registry, that 54% were women. And, and I must say, um, private sectors, it's worse, like the banks. They don't use law firms that are women-owned. They prefer the white-owned firms. There's relationships that are beyond us. And you'll see that in, in national politics, there's white monopoly capital forces that are still playing out their space in the country. The banks, when you go there, they tell you you need a balance sheet of 7.3 million to even do business with them. This is just to do conveyancing work, because part of our work is conveyancing. And, and my concern is we have the best laws in the country. Our policymakers are doing brilliant work. They are really trying to come with, up with the most transformative laws. They are coming up with the most transformative policies to guide this country into the next revolution of its, of its freedom. But the implementation across all sectors is not being done and not being monitored to a point where we can see the difference on the ground. The laws are there, they are good, but as I've mentioned, they lack they lack implementation and political will. We, I listened to the president's speech the other day where he was talking about his action coalitions, and he mentioned things like economic justice. We must also remember that legally, you can be as radical as you want to, and you can be as willing like we all are here today, but if the system is not creating the environment for you to participate, we will still be disadvantaged, and we will still sit here today and every year, and we will talk about how women are not in this space. The proposal from the president of 40% procurement across women and government spend needs to be implemented as a matter of urgency. It needs to be implemented from even today. When we leave here, there needs to be things in place that can be done today to liberate the women economically. There are no jobs. The country cannot provide enough jobs. We will need to, we will need to make sure that small businesses can come up and start operating as fast as possible. And women love business, I've seen it. We love doing business, we love doing supply, we love doing all those things. But if the environment is not set for us to participate, we will still be disadvantaged. So when we leave here today, we need to start implementing from next month or even end of this month, that 40% procurement across all government spend must go to women and youth owned businesses. We need to get things like transformation laws that must be implemented across the private sector as well. And if you don't do it, there must be grave consequences like deregistration from SIPSI or SARS so that you are forced to come in and transform your company and transform your procurement spend and how you are doing business. We cannot be majority of black people and still be complaining about not participating in mainstream economy. Deployment and employment needs to be implemented according to demographics of the country, meaning all women have to be considered. Black women, colored women, Indian women. It cannot be correct that only one class of women are considered for any position across any employment or deployment. Lastly, we can even look at more drastic measures like total tax exemptions for women-owned businesses. This 28% is killing us. This 15% VAT payment is killing us. Provisional taxes are killing small women-owned businesses. The margins are low. We are not making money. COVID has seen a total collapse of the economy and we will still live under that for the next two years. So those are the things that I can leave government with from a legal perspective that the laws are there, they are good. We just need to be ready and intentional when we implement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Need I say more? Um, <laughs> Okay, yeah, maybe I shouldn't say anything after what she has said. Clearly, uh, all those pieces of legislations that we are having, they lack 
in being implemented. Because had they been implemented, we wouldn't be talking this language that you're hearing. I'm sure a lot of you are depressed, uh, but we'll get there. We'll get there. And uh, it, it looks like there's, there's, there's an intention to, to delay all this. But the heroes that you are, women, and the leaders that you are, I know you shall never surrender. You shall never surrender. We shall get to a point where we want to be. And having said that, we, we, we do not dismiss the efforts that our government is, is making and the strides thereof. But clearly, there's, there's more that still has to be done. And, and, and perhaps I need to share with you just something as my experience that happened to me. I'm grateful, I'm grateful, make no mistake. But I want you to get uh, the picture uh, in it, which will then tell you where we are as a country. Last night, I received an appointment letter. I'm being appointed in the Board of uh, Gambling and Liquor, and also uh, uh, um, uh, appointed as the Deputy Chairperson of that Board. So there are strides, but you must remember the last part, the deputy chairperson. <laughs> so we're getting there, biki biki, we're getting there. And, and I'm going to not waste time with uh, uh, Mrs. Zonke. Are you, are you in Mrs. Zonke? Is she here? Okay, Mrs. Zonke is going to speak to us. Hey, Mrs. Zonke, I hope you are going to give us some hope uh, in the education sector. Because already we have a burden of unemployed young graduates in this room. And, and you are there in the sector, you'll probably give us some hope. Uh, as you walk down to the podium, uh, and I'm not saying if there's no hope, we should make as if there's hope. <laughs> I'm not trying to say that. But uh, we would do with some hope. We'd do with some, you know, beautiful news that shows where we're getting. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much, program director the Honorable Premier in absentia, Honorable Speaker, the Deputy Honorable Speaker, Deputy Speaker, the Honorable MEC who is here, Honorable Members of the Executive, the Ministers of Religion, and all other the important guests the men and women that are invited here, unemployed graduates, let me take this opportunity and greet you this morning. Program director, you are putting me under pressure because I was listening attentively when other people were talking. Now when education comes, you are saying education is supposed to give people hope. In a nutshell, that is what education is about. Just to say education enriches people's understanding of themselves and the world. It improves the quality of their lives and leads to broad social benefits to individuals and society. It plays a very crucial role in securing economic and social progress and improving income distribution. Program director, I'm just going to rattle through my presentation because of time. I've never done any presentation for five minutes, but I'll try, I will try to do that. But here I also wanted to talk 
about the metric results of 2019. In particular, what I wanted to talk about in those results is to say 2019 NSC exams for grade 12, we had 224, 906 girls who passed metric. And out of that number, when you look in terms of comparisons, 80.1, it was the percentage for girls, 82.8, it was the percentage for boys. But what I want to highlight here is the fact that 2019 metric results, the top metric girl in the country was a girl, I mean, the top metric candidate in the country was a girl, Madeleine Dipenaf. When you come to the free state, the top metric in the free state 2019 was a girl, Muleleke Mokwena, who came from Kwakwa, who managed to get seven distinctions, with 100% in physical science, 99% in mathematics. I am raising all these things, program director, just to say, as female, as women, there is nothing wrong with us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, program director, now because I am the district director for Lijoli Puzo Education District in Velcom, some of the stats, I took the stats from my district. Like for an example, when I check in terms of the stats that we had for last year, the female educators, we have 70.9 in terms of percentage. But when you check in terms of the principles that we have in the district, out of 224 schools, we only have 60 females, female principals, which is 26.7. That is telling us, that is telling me as a district director to say the appointments going forward, they are talking to equity targets it's one thing to have a policy. It's another thing to make sure that that policy is implemented. So what we are doing now, we are making sure that we want to check in terms of how do we capacitate women to be able to be part and participate in those positions. Because it cannot be correct that at the end of the day we don't find them in leadership positions. The SMS members in my department, it's only 19.5%. I know Mem Koni from the office of the speaker, you talked about the stats. We're not doing very well when it comes to that in terms of women in leadership. I also checked, because I'm a person who's dealing with education, I checked uh, in terms of the research that was done by Professor Beverly from the University of the Western Cape, where there was a colloquium for the South African Association of Women Graduates, where when you check in terms of numbers, when you check way back from 1986, in terms of women in leadership in tertiary institution, we are still not doing very well as a country. So this is a report that we received from the Western Cape. But what really disturbed was the fact that even those that are already in the leadership position, they are not supposed to publish anything when it comes to publishing. He says there, I quote him ver verbatim, the reason for the discrepancy between the proportion of women publishing and the women of these 90% where proportion of higher education is that women are largely concentrated at the bottom of the ladder. So the challenge is we still struggle. We still do not have women in leadership even at the tertiary institution. Those that are already there, some of them are not even allowed to do some of the publishing. So those are the realities that we need to flag so that when we go forward out of this gathering, we are able to say where to from here. Because at the end of the day, we don't even want to create the young ones or the young girls who will come and lament. We want people who will stand up and say, not in this generation. Department of Women, Youth, and Persons with Disability. When you check at that policy, program two, it talks about social transformation and economic empowerment. 
The purpose of this program is to facilitate and promote the attainment of women's socioeconomic empowerment and gender equality. We normally say in all instances, in all platforms, when you educate a girl, when you educate a woman, you educate the whole nation. Women unemployment in South Africa. I checked in terms of the statistics, South Africa, it's not a recent report, but when you look at the trends, it's still happening even now. Because the one that I managed to get, it was a report of 2018, where it is saying only 32% of managers in South Africa were women. So it is telling you, if it is 32%, the majority is from the other side. And that is problematic. We need to make sure what are the reasons that are making this and how can we capacitate the young ones so that this should not repeat itself. Socioeconomic emancipation. I'm trying to align myself, program director, to the theme that I was given. When you talk about eman emancipation, you talk freedom. Emancipation is any effort to procure economic and social political rights or equality, often for a specifically disenfranchised group or more generally in discussion of many matters. Then we come to economic emancipation. It is described as the freedom to determine one's financial position. Women's emancipation is not just about freedom from gender-based violence. Female marginalization, illiteracy, and other ills afflicting society. It is in fact essential to the formation of civil societies, nation building, and a world without exploitation. Gender inequality means not only foregoing the important contributions that women make to the economy, but also spending years of investment in educating year girls and young women. Then, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was the issue, what is the impact of education in social change? Because this has to change, and where do you get in as education? The most significant functions of education in a society are to socialize individuals, to enable the continuity of the society, and to raise generations that try to establish social change. How to promote social change? Share important information, build and engage community, provide training and education. Exactly what we are doing today, we might not be many because we are living under the new normal, the new pandemic, COVID-19. So the number, we are not many here, but I am sure, Program Director, that from here, we are going to go back to our areas and we are going to do the impact. Social values, social values form an important part of culture of the society. Values account for the stability of social order. They provide the general guidelines for social conduct. Values like fundamental rights, patriotism, respect of human dignity, rationality, sacrifice, individuality, equality, democracy, the list is long. Justice, freedom, respect, community, and responsibility. Women are a huge catalyst for socioeconomic development. South Africa's economic empowerment mechanisms for promoting the status of women, fully utilizing government resources and effectively mobilizing social resources provided by corporate South Africa, lays an important foundation in the promotion of gender equality and women's development. We have challenges in the country, in the province, in terms of making sure that the women are also in higher positions. What are the six socioeconomic challenges in South Africa? The issues of employment, unemployment, the skill shortages and the demand of high level human resources, labor market flexibility, poverty and inequality. We also have the five socioeconomic factors in South Africa. Socioeconomic factors include occupation, education, income, wealth, and shelter. I'm not going to talk about the social imbalances. We all know that history. I am not here to repeat it now. 
But the issue is what I want to say. As raised these following things, but I want, I want to say we need to come up with strategies. And as education, our main strategy is to promote the girl child in the classroom. That is an investment. Hence, I said we don't want to have the girl child that will still be lamenting in terms of saying we don't get space. We want them to fight for space. Because I can assure you that when you are a leader in a patriarchal society, every time you need to double the efforts. And you should not get tired of doubling those efforts. But at the end of the day, the work that you are doing as a leader, whether you are a woman or a man, if you are firm and if you know exactly what is expected of you, at the end of the day, you'll still be respected. But we cannot wait and look at other people to respect us. But we need to stand up and say we are here and we want our space. So what are we doing to promote the girl child in the classroom? Making the classroom more child-centered and gender sensitive. The issues of gender in our classrooms now, that is what we're emphasizing. We are always talking about them. Eliminating gender bias from textbooks and learning materials. Even the learning materials that our learners are now studying in the classroom are there learning materials that are assisting us so that at the end of the day, we are able to make our girls know that they are also important. Gathering gender-specific education statistics, providing early childhood programs, enabling young mothers to return to school, encouraging girls participating and activism in education. So that is what we are doing as education to make sure that our learners, when they grow as young girls, they know exactly what is expected of them. I'm about to finish, program director. Uh, why women should be empowered in economic terms? When women have the right skills and opportunities, they can help businesses and markets to grow. Women are economically empowered, who are economically empowered, contribute to their families, society, and nationwide economies. Women invest extra income in their children, providing a route to sustain to sustainable developments. When a woman has money, the first thing that you think of is your children. Meaning that as a country, as a province, when we give women skills, we will be making sure that we are addressing the issues of poverty. How can we empower these women? Place women as leaders and give them decision-making roles. Give more job opportunities for women. Invest in women entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial ideas like cooperatives. For an example, if I can talk about education, what we want to do now in terms of making sure that we capacitate these women is to say if there is anything that needs the cooperatives, let us go to the women. We have issues of NSNP in our schools where the learners are fed. So for starters, we say let's start with women so that they go and have the, they, they have these companies where they go and collect the groceries to come and feed our learners so that at least there is something that they are getting. Our schools, we have uniforms. Some of the schools were saying don't go to Atlas in Velcom in some, in some instances. Utilize the people that are able to make the uniform in your community. By that way, you will be bringing something on the, on the table. Mentoring women professionally and personally. Lastly, program director, I just wanted to flag in terms of the programs, additional programs that we have as schools. Like for an example, at a school we have life orientation. Life orientation is one of the subjects that other people would be thinking that it is not important. But when you read and go through that subject, you'll see that it is a subject that is teaching our learners in terms of morals and values, in terms of the issues of confidence, in terms of the issues of independence. Because if we don't teach those girls to be independent, tomorrow they will want other people to tell them how do they look like. The motivation that we are doing now as education, motivation for both boys and girls, because we don't want to create another patriarchal society. We don't want to create the monsters. 
Hence, at the end of the day, even if you have done anything wrong as a boy, we want to go deeper to say, what is making you to do this? Only to find we are bringing up an angry society, and we should not do that. We need to make sure that we do away with the issue of bringing up the angry society. Increase the number of participation of girls in particular for maths and science, because maths and science is a scarce skill. So it means when your girls have maths and science, they will be able to do subjects like engineering. One of the speakers here was talking about the mining area to say now we find women that are participating there. For them to be recognized, it's important that we also teach our learners to do that. The dialogue, debates where we are talking about issues of gender equity. Lastly, the very last one, the, the buzzeries that we have now. We have buzzeries that we are saying these buzzeries should only be given to a certain group of boys and certain group of girls because we want to make sure that they study. And in my district, what we are doing now, program director, we have a program where we are capacitating women in leadership from the HOD level until the principal level. Because I was saying last time I visited, I'm sure four schools where the principals are women, I said to them, we want when we check the results, when we look back, we find that the schools that are led by women, the results are very good. Then we need to start by capacitating them so that at the end of the day, we are also respected. So we are bringing the young ones that we say to them, it's high time that we need to fight for our space because we are here in these positions, not that it was because of equity targets, it was because there is nothing wrong with us. Hence, I started with that one of saying, even the girl who is leading in the country, we, it's a girl, that shows us there's nothing wrong with us as women. Thank you very much, Program Director. Thank you, Ime Zonke. I indeed anticipated well. There's so much hope in everything that she said. Despite those uh, positions that are still lacking, uh, uh, the, the leadership positions about women, but there's so much hope, there is nothing wrong with us. I mean, if you have Bome Zonke, we are clearly led. Women who would tell you how to solve a problem and not become part of the problem. Transport networks are one of the most important elements of country's infrastructure, and they're key to, 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 to reducing poverty and promoting equality. That infrastructure generally centers on enabling the supply of goods. We know it connects and, and, and provide access to people when you want to go to your families, you'll, you use transport, and also even trading transport plays. However, it has only been about 10 years that we have women as, as a, a role players in that uh, infrastructure. And uh, it, is, it, is, it is only then that women are, are starting to uh, contribute in, in the country's economy. And Men and women use transport differently. That is why women, men and women are being looked at differently using transport. That is why we still have tech, men taxi owners who will still whistle at a woman wearing a mini skirt in a taxi. But you'll never find anything wrong with any man wearing anything, no matter how funny it is, in a taxi. Therefore, we cannot turn a blind eye. Equitable access to public transport is about making their need for safe, efficient, sustainable mobility that indeed trans transport sector has been very hostile to women. Let me allow Mem Gluli to tell us more about transport sector. I really want to say, Mezonke declared that I have never, I have actually never presented in five minutes. <laughs> and also that taught me, actually not only teaching me, but reminded me 
that there is nothing that you can teach a teacher. <laughs> there is nothing that you can do to stop a teacher from teaching. So I, 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 just, I just gave up with, those, with that knowledge and understanding. But I will still ask every other speaker to try and, sp and stick to time. And, and, and Mem Dluli, as you're coming, we are expecting to take a break. It was at about 12 o'clock, but we'll give it to 5 past 12. We'll still have uh, Melinye Hello and Mem Moroka. Uh, we still have four, meaning it will be about 20 minutes. We'll take a break at quarter past 12. When we come back, we'll just need about 20 minutes of declaration announcement and uh, we'll have another 20 minutes of engagements because I think that is the most important thing that you are here for, to, to speak to issues, engage on issues. I'm actually doing that because I thought she was walking by. Let me get an indication, is she here? It looks like she's not here. The challenges, therefore, in transport, it still may, uh, remains more training. I'm sure you have heard how many times women are being trained in transport, but there is less or no job opportunities if you want to speak. How many women can we speak of in railways, in airways, in serious stuff like bus? And, and, and we don't know any, any, any women. You, you listen to radios, popular shows about taxi industry. They don't even know how to address women. They, the last time they checked, it was Boradi Tekesi. And it becomes so difficult for a presenter to include a woman in that. And they start, oh, Lebo Madi Tekesi. You can even hear from, from, from when they say that it's so, uh, it's, it's, it's not easy to say. It's so not easy to say. We will quickly move to the Melinye Hello. Are you here, Melinye Hello? Yes, thank you very much. Melinye Hello will speak to us about agriculture, the expertise of women, people who have always known that spinach and uh, carrots and everything else behind the yard, banabaja, bakhuresam banapasho. Even when she's not waking. Over to you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Program Director. Uh, I'd like to greet uh, Madam Speaker and Deputy Madam Speaker and our guests, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for this opportunity, you know, to come here and share my experience in the agricultural sector. Well, our program director spoke about Hojala uh, Dispinich, no, the refugee level program director, now commercial farming, <laughs> right? Hojala di sunflower, re breeder, and then now we mean business. All right. Um, as you know that uh, agriculture is a cornerstone of South African economy, and of the 16.37 million people employed in South Africa, almost 50% are directly or indirectly employed in the agricultural sector. So be it primary, secondary, or tertiary uh, agriculture. So in Free State, one of the key economic sectors is agriculture, right? However, <laughs> I am standing here, you know, with a certain heart, Madam Speaker, uh, to tell you that as women, you know, a, a women participation in the entire value chain uh, in the agricultural sector is very low. Uh, women do not have freedom to determine their own financial position and future. So we're talking about um, economic emancipation. Okay, let us start by describing what is economic emancipation. You know, it can be described as a freedom to determine <coughs> one's own financial position and future. So for us women in agriculture, we are feeling to do that. 
Um, Madam Speaker, you have alluded and raised a very important issue of a lack of policy implementation by the government. It is a reality. It is very, very, uh, you know, sad because now we are in control. We, or oh, let me not be political. <laughs> we are in, in control of, 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 the, of the government, but still we fail to implement those policies that, that are written by us. I think we are the ones who wrote those uh, policies, but we fail to implement them. Why? We just don't know. Madam Speaker, um, we still have a lack of access to markets that hinders the growth of women in agriculture. Market is a problem. At this day and day Asian time, we still depend on a white monopoly um, capital or white owned enterprises, companies, or even cooperatives, you know, to supply us with seeds, uh, mechanizations, implements, you know, your fertilizers, your chemicals for us to, to work the land. There's no even single white, I mean, black-owned company that provides such. We depend on them, and they determine the prices. You know, when even you go there and buy whether fertilizers or all the input costs, they ask you, are you being uh, supported by the government? So what does that tell you, right? So it's a problem. And um, there was a, a, a agri-park agri master plan by the Department of Rural Development, which is a, a network innovation system of agro-production, processing, logistics, marketing, trading, and extension services located in the district municipalities. So in my municipality, uh, in Lijua Lipuza, it was supposed to be um, situated in Versesbro. But that has never happened, Madam Speaker. Because at least that would have given us the opportunity to partake in the mainstream economy and you know, to, to take our produce to our silos. Because now, in this modern South Africa, in this democratic South Africa, we don't have a black owned silos. We buy seeds from the white companies and all the input costs, the tractors, your, your implements. We work the land, difficult as it is, is, we take our produce to white owned silos, they determine the price for us, we use their own transportation. So, where are we in, in this economic uh, affair? So, um, participation in enterprise and supply development is very low. For an example, the total revenue of retail and supermarket in the free state is over 100 billion. But we don't have women who participate or who are involved in that space. And um, I think it is a responsibility of the government, you know, to play an advocacy role uh, to see to it that the private sector, you know, support uh, interpre entrepreneurs, even women in farming, you know, so that they can tap into that market or into that space. So now, when you go and try to advocate in the mining industry or even in the private sector or in the supermarkets or retail uh, sectors, they ask us, your government, your own government failed to help you. So how can we help you? Which is true and which is a, a, a reality, it's a truth. So government should set an uh, example to uh, private sectors so that they can be able to, you know, to accord, accommodate us in order to tap into that space. Um, another issue is land acquisition and ownership. I think we've seen on, uh, on TV that uh, there was an audit report, you know, for farm ownership, you know, and then they, they, they did, did it by race, whereby um, farm ownership, ne, white own 72%, <laughs> colored 
14%, Indians 5%, and Africans 4%. And then when we sing our national anthem, at the end there, uh, in South Africa, our land. Which land? Whereby we only own 4%. So meaning basically we don't have land. It's sad. It's really sad. Uh, I, I know I'm anti what word, but hey, let me just try to, to be polite. <laughs> so, so one wonders, uh, out of that 4%, what percentage of uh, farms are owned by black women? So, mm -hmm. we still have a long way to go. Really, we still have land issue. It is a very thorny and critical issue. And that should be addressed as soon as possible. Because you know, the environment in the uh, agriculture sector is not women friendly, most especially black women. We have to fight. For you to get anything, you have to fight. Because you have to fight. Because I told them that I'm a Kenyan in agriculture and I'm here to stay, and I'm an agent of change in the agricultural sector. So among other problems that we are facing in a agriculture as women is the climate change. You know, that remains a huge problem, and the irrigation problem as well on the farms. Uh, you know that the country uh, increased population by 2% per annum, and we as uh, farmers, we are obligated to feed the nation. So, and it becomes very difficult for us with limited resources to do such. And uh, nature conservation as well, uh, because it can persist the future generation. So we have to, you know, uh, protect that as well. Roads and infrastructure are in a bad state. Even the farms and the roads that we are using uh, Madam Speaker, uh, in a bad state. And even the, the, the logistics part, we still depend on white uh, companies, you know, to take our fresh produce to, to the silos and stuff. We don't have even all, uh, our own black uh, owned or even women, uh, black women owned uh, logistic companies that we use or, or maybe that we can outsource, you know, uh, for, 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 for such activities. So. I mean, agriculture is not only a primary agriculture or uh, only. So there are a lot of opportunities in agriculture that one can even consider, you know, to, to venture into. And uh, we are living in a particular society, as we know, and it remains a challenge to us. And then the, um, wh wh when you think of agriculture, one would think of a male. At this day, Asian time, you know, gender-based violence is very rife in, in South Africa, as you know. You know, sometimes I knock off at 12 uh, midnight when we plant the, uh, the fields, you know, so you can just imagine because I have to transport stuff. So it's a problem. Even our security uh, on the farms is a huge problem. That should be considered. And then, um, as women, we are expected to, you know, to be caring for our families and to maintaining homes, whereas as, as a, a woman in farming. And um, I would like to encourage each and everyone in the room, you know, when they get home, to start some vegetable gardening. Please, I preach that on my Facebook page everywhere I go. Please do that. And it will help Katabaya uh, food security and nutrition as well, and for our health. Thank you so much. also for calling me to order and not reduce you to planting a uh, miroho kamrajarete 
but also exonerated me in your in your last statement to say I encourage you, Limami Ro. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, unfortunately, as I sit there and listening to speakers, I'm able to 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 just reiterate on a number of uh, uh, factors that they mentioned. But Mewa is just too soft for me. But I'm just glad because he, she was facing you, you were able to hear. But th there's not much. I'm, I'm just glad that you heard her quite well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, when you look in your program, you can see that we were awaiting, or we have in our program, Mufuma um, Hadi AAG Muroka. Unfortunately, Me Muroka won't be here because of the untimely passing of the principal traditional leader of Barolombo Sili, Kahosi Suhunelo Kinsli Muroka, in saying that I'm going to ask you just to stand up for a moment of silence uh, for a couple of seconds uh, in respecting the departed soul. May his departed soul rest in peace. Thank you. Amen. Uh, we quickly going to move to Medjanin. I'm not going to say your surname. I'm a linguist, and I respect how you pronounce people's names. And I know how important that is. So I'll hear her, how she pronounces her surname, and moving forward, I'll know how to pronounce it. But I'm not saying it now. <laughs> and then also we'll have uh, Ms. Boyson, please be ready. I was just advised not to have a break, but because I'm, only, I'm the only person uh, directing the program, I'm gonna ask for five minutes, ma'am, we born with due respect, because I quickly want to run to the bathroom after Meji Boyson. Five minutes. Actually, the break is for myself. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I come back, we will then um, uh, get straight into uh, the engagements. Over to you, Mejanin. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, my program director. My name is Janine. My surname is Tonga. Tonga, yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, uh, greetings to everyone, uh, Honorable Speaker um, of the House, Honorable Deputy Speaker, Honorable MEC, and everyone that is in this room today. First and foremost, I want to greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I am a Greek woman residing on the Batani farm, and uh, I'm using this opportunity to speak for our Greek people. As a Greek tribe in the free state, we are facing many factors that make it difficult to contribute to the South African economy. For example, that the government is creating confusion within our community. There is an illegal BCPA group on that farm who is not acknowledging our leader and claimant, Captain Johannes Dungi Kralshoek. So currently, our land, one of the four factors of economic growth, still has not been resolved. As uh, in tribal authorities, we need to fight for everything, for instance, acknowledgement and assistance. So why should we as a Greek traditional group, especially our, our women, uh, fight for rights in a democratic land? Um, I'm going to use, as um, Madam Program Director spoke, uh, said earlier on, if we speak from our own experiences, we can only be telling the truth. Where I'm staying, a um, few weeks ago, two men came to my house, ne? telling me that 
um, they are going to remove me from where I'm staying. I don't belong in that house. I was retrenched from my job in March this year. At the moment, I'm unemployed. So there's ongoing fighting going on on our farm, the Batani farm. There are men, yo, I don't, I don't have words to explain the abuse that's happening there. Um, women are being threatened that they, they are going to be raped in this day and age of today. We don't know where to run to. We, if we go to the police station on Edinburgh, the, the, the police, the people there, I don't know if they are turning a blind eye or something, but we don't know where to go, what to do. Um, we want to ask, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Griqua community on Batani, please assist us in ways that we can sustain ourselves on that farm. I hear that agriculture has a lot of problems, but on a farm, agriculturally, is the only way that we can sustain ourselves. From the government, from agriculture, please, please, we plea, help us, the Griqua people, on the farm. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much, Metonga. You, you said so less, but my, my heart is heavy. I cannot even begin to think of what could be going on in that place. You said government is causing confusion. And government, government in its nature is not to cause confusion, but to give direction and support and protect its people. The, country, the constitution of the country is speaking for the minorities, and uh, especially women. Uh, maybe that we have speaker here and we also have members of the executive. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody from the municipality with the programs that are there. Perhaps if there could be an outreach program there to go and understand what are the other issues. Uh, um, um, you know, in, in leadership of government, I'm this small. Don't think I'm, I'm, I'm just pleading for you and with you. <laughs> I'm, I'm not making any promises, but perhaps an outreach would find that there are issues of social uh, uh, the social issues, you could find the issues of people without, in those social issues without IDs, and we want those people to vote. It is their right. You'll find that people are living under the poverty line there, and uh, maybe um, it is not known. Uh, programs such as uh, uh, outreaches, they're able to, 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 to get to the bottom of such issues. So may uh, our leaders are here and they have heard you. They are here and they have heard you. Me uh, as year. Oh, and I know Me Boysen very well. I don't know why did I forget that it could have been you. Uh, she is from LGBTQI, and uh, she's going to tell us their experiences and some of the things. We are still very ignorant when it comes to. Uh, 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 these, 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 these communities. We are still very judgmental when it comes to them. Some of us are even using uh, religion to degrade them. Some of us are even using our muscles to degrade them. Some of us are using anything that we have to make them feel as small as, 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 as insects. So let us hear from them what is it that they are experiencing? Over to you. Good, is it afternoon already? <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the invite. Um, program director, thank you so much for the warm welcome. Honorable speaker, uh, deputy speaker, 
and everyone that's here. Um, I've tried to summarize this as, as, as much as I can because um, it, I'm also aware of time because there's quite a lot of issues that the, trans com the, 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 it, the community faces. So I'm just going to get straight into it. Um, I'm not going to, I think, it, do you think it's necessary to, 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 to go through what LGBT stands for? I think everybody has an idea of, please, okay. All right, um, L stands for le lesbian. This is, this, is, this is a woman who, who identifies as a female, or as a cisgender woman, but is attracted holistically and emotionally to another female. And then you get gay. Gay is a male, a cisgender male. Cis meaning the, 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 the gender that you were born in. That is the, 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 the gender that you identify with. So a cisgender man that, I, that is attracted to another man. Okay, and then we get bi, uh, the, the B. The B stands for bisexual. Um, this is either male or female that is attracted to both sexes or both genders. And then we get, um, we get the T, which is transgender. This is, this is a person who, whose gender identity does not align with, the with, with, with how the, the, the gender that they were assigned at birth. Because I'm sure we all know that when we are born, we're either assigned male or female. But as we grow up, we realize that actually, this is not how I identify as, and this is what we call a trans person. Um, the next one is intersex. Intersex is usually a medical condition um, that, um, that they are either born with both parts or uh, they have a, a, a hormone imbalance and that needs medical attention. And the Q is queer or questioning. It's somebody that, that does not want to be identified as either male or female. They just want to show up as they are as a person. Um, and then the plus, the plus is, is, is everybody else. Is everybody else, somebody who does not want to be boxed, if we can call it that. All right, I was, I was asked to, to, to speak on um, the inclusivity of trans people. Okay, I have tried to narrow it down as much as, I, as, as, much as possible. Um, job spaces. Trans people are often not considered when it comes to jobs. Uh, when they show up at interviews, they are immediately rejected because they are expecting, they are expecting a man. Um, how many of, of us in this room can actually say that you've actually worked with a trans person? other than varsity. Not a lot of us, we don't, we don't even know them. Um, and then also, trans people are stuck in jobs that they, do, that they don't even like anymore, they've outgrown, because they are so scared of leaving that job because, because they know that if they go for another interview, showing up as themselves, they're going to have to they're going to have to be discriminated and not get a job, and, and also fear of never ever getting a job ever again. Um, some trans women, and I, th I feel like this is the worst, some trans women are forced to show up as an, as, as, as an, in an identity that they do not identify as because they want to get that job. So this is some of the job, the job, the, 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 the employment, problems that trans people face, or trans women face. Um, opportunities, trans women are, are often not looked at. Um, like, most, like, most trans, like most cisgender women, most cisgender women are not looked at when it comes to opportunities in business. Um, unfortunately, uh, their business remains stagnant when it comes to that and they can't expand, they can't grow, they can't go bigger unless they are in an industry like hair or nails or I know how to do hair and nails, but I don't want to do hair. I don't want to do somebody else's hair and nails. I want to do my own. You understand? 
Um, also, lawmakers. Um, there are no trans. There are no trans voices that are in lawmaking. It's 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 always a. It's always it it and it ends up being a situation of take what we're giving you. Um, the health services. This is this is this is one of the worst. Uh, trans women usually need to access their hormones. In many 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 places, trans women do not one know where to start to get their hormones. Um, they also don't know. They are also turned away from getting their hormones because they need two letters. They need a, lot, a, a letter from a psychologist and a letter from the doctor. Mm -hmm. And if, if either of them say that this person does not identify as a trans woman, this trans woman will not get her letter and also not get her hormones. And this leads to, 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 to depression and a lot of suicide that's happening. One of the worst ones is how, how health, health officials um, I, um, address trans women. Um, it's often, you'll, you will get into a space and then they'll see the ID number or they'll see the name and then they'll say, Ntate mang mang. You understand? So they end up not going back to that facility. And HIV is a big problem in our country. And then they end up defaulting on their on they, on they medicine because of that, those discriminations that they face. Um, something that, that annoys me the most out of this is gender-based violence. Um, trans people are being killed for being trans people all the time. And when the media raves about it, you'll never see a trans face anywhere. Anywhere, it's, it's, being, it's being shoved within our community alone, and we have to deal with it. And when we go from pillar to post, the, the case usually just dies. Even if you know for a fact who killed that trans woman, the case just never gets solved. Um, and then discrimination in schools. This is the worst, because this is where it starts. Um, trans women are usually forced to wear cl cl clothes that they do not identify with. I mean, yes, we can say that somebody in primary school does not understand themselves yet. But somebody in high school, they have a good idea of who they are. They have a very good idea of who they are. So they should be allowed to, 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 to start showing up as themselves in schools. This also leads to a greater greater, uh, what's this, dropout in schools. And that therefore they can't go to universities, they can't um, start businesses, because they don't have the knowledge of starting all of that. Now they're dependent on their parents. Uh, the last one. Um, the last one is language. People of, often, I know it comes from a good place, but people, people forget to ask trans women, how do you want to be addressed? Which is very, very important. And also, it's become very, how can I put it? It's become very, 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 people have become very comfortable asking people, so have you done the surgery? It's nobody's business whether, you, whether the person has done the surgery or not. I am telling you I'm a woman, so you should respect that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Boyson. And uh, you heard her. You heard her. And we need to change our behaviors towards the things we, don't, we have no idea about. The only best thing is to ask. And I'm sure they will be able to explain to you. Also, it comes straight from home. Mothers and fathers will force you to wear a dress. 
before school discriminates against you, we would have been forced from home. You know, so we, we really, really have to protect our people. And uh, a lot of them have died already. And uh, we need to prevent more deaths. They are senseless killings. We, we cannot, as a country, as women, be associated with such acts. Ladies and gentlemen, we came to the end of the last, the first part of our program. And we're gonna go to the second one where we're going to be engaged. And I'm going to ask uh, for um, my honorable uh, table here to take your seat and the presenter these seats when we do that, 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 that part. Um, I'm doing so, my honorables, because uh, if there could be some questions and if the presenters could take something home to go and tell their principals that this is what women are saying. And uh, um, it will be, uh, I think, better that way, if you allow me with due respect. And I am going to take a break of five minutes. <laughs> when we come back, we'll just uh, do th that and we'll do it in a manner of raising hands I'll take, I'll see how many people are asking questions. I'll take hands with rounds. The first round, second, and then that will be it. It doesn't look like the way our presenters were audible and were to the point. I doubt if there could be a number of questions. Although, uh, Mewaruna.